Wow. What a great song. What a sensational band. Can I have a go at your guitar? Really? I'm just kidding. I, just, I was loving that guitar. Anyone else ever get distracted in worship? It's the worst thing being an ADHD pastor. <laughs> I love you, God. How good's that guitar? I love you, God. Hey, we do that song. I love you, God. Oh, we should. Ah, I forgot to do this. I love you, Lord. I love this song. I'm worshiping you, Lord, God. Don't forget to mention this in your sermon. I love you. <laughs> it's like exhausting having my brain sometimes. It is so good to be here. And we had a fantastic time in the 8.30 a.m. service. And uh, what a fantastic church this is. As Tim mentioned before, um, I do feel like I feel really at home when I come here. I, such a welcoming community. There's a great atmosphere. There's a great love for God and for engaging the community. And uh, today, um, in this message series that the church is doing, it's called uh, Mission Possible. And uh, I've titled this particular Um, message today, Navigating the Beautiful Mess. And uh, who thinks that's good? I haven't told you about it yet, but uh, anyway, I'm glad you're positive. So um, what's the name of your local football team? (laughs) The Power. (laughs) That's all I wanted to say. I just think, what a brilliant name for a football team. Power. And then you lost it, and then you got it back. (laughs) It's a great parallel to the actual game itself, isn't it? Yeah. Is it hard for you guys when you see the Sydney Swans in the grand final so regularly? (laughs) I'm just kidding. Do you know what? I, I have a love for AFL now because Tim, who's actually from Sydney, who's an NRL boy, who now got converted to AFL, got me into AFL because I went to see the Port versus the Crows game down here. It was fantastic. And now I'm into it. And it's so good that Sydney Swans are going so good. <laughs> I mean, we didn't win. We let the other team have a go. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, let's pray and then we're going to jump into this message. Father, I pray that uh, this morning you would open up our hearts, that you would speak to us. Um, would you just do something fresh in us this morning, that when we walk out of this building, we walk out with a renewed sense of purpose and um, passion and calling, a greater love and awareness of who you are and what you're trying to do. And uh, may we just be open to what you're going to do this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this morning I want to read to you a passage of Scripture from the book of Uh, Romans chapter 12, and there's quite a few verses we're going to look at for a few moments. And what I'd like you to do as we look through, obviously there's a little bit of a hint because you'll see some highlighted parts in these verses, but I want you to um, allow what we're going to read for the next few moments just to to get in your heart and mind. And then as I share some stories this morning uh, about my own journey and, and some of the things that God's been teaching me, I want you to try and see these stories that I share in the light of this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at together because um, I'm seeing a a fascinating parallel. And then uh, I'm going to make a a, a wider point this morning that relates to our mission and how we actually engage in the mission that Jesus has called us to, um, every single one of us in this room. Um, So let's have a look at this passage of Scripture together. This um, letter Paul wrote to the church in Rome and in chapter 12, uh, it's one of my favourite passages of Scripture. It's such a great picture of the uh, kingdom of God. And I was looking up there for the scripture passage to come up, but I've got the remote, so (laughs) I'll press it, all right? I think it's on. There we go. It's on. I have the power. (laughs) Sorry, that was a dad joke. All right. um, Paul says, don't just pretend to love others. Honest to God question. You'll know if you're lying. Have you ever pretended to love someone? Give me a show of hands. 
So many of you just lied then. <laughs> Don't just, uh, that, was, that was a bit discouraging. I, I trust you all. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Thanks. I didn't press that then. <laughs> Someone's with me. Uh, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know at all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honourable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the Scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Sounds pretty full on, doesn't it? Do what that actually means? Actually, it's from Proverb. It actually means they will be so shocked and surprised because you have acted graciously. You have broken the cycle of violence in a world where you hit me, I hit you. And we just keep hitting each other and it goes nowhere. This shocks someone into the reality of, whoa, I can't keep living this way. And then Paul finishes this section by saying, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You know, every single day, there is one person who's discovering the beauty and the joy and the wonder of this world. And at the exact same time, there is somebody else who's encountering pain, brokenness, loss, doubt, grief. At any given moment, even in your own life, you can move from a point where one minute you're cheering and you're celebrating and then the next minute you're going, oh my goodness, my whole life seems like it's falling apart. Parents know this better than anyone. One moment you're going, my kid is amazing. And seriously, three seconds later, you're going, ah, what happened to my kid? Who are their parents? And then they smile at you again. You go, ah, my kid is awesome. You know, it's like, it's like ah, no wonder like we get gray hair all of a sudden and just things change so quickly with your body when you're a parent because you're just like, you can't deal with that dramatic change every five seconds. So um, Tim mentioned that um, I've shared over the years kind of like my unfolding journey and uh, some of you know um, from having heard my story before that, you know, I, I've had, a, <laughs> I started off having a really cruisy life as a kid, nice middle class Christian family, everything went normal. And then when I went into my 20s, like, it was like, whoa, what happened to my life? What, what did I do wrong? Was it because I lied when I was 17, as the song says? Or, um, you know, like, how come things aren't working out the way I dreamed or the way I decided when I was 18 in my first year of Bible college and we had to write down our goals for the next 10 years, where we'd see our life? And you're just like, wow, I'm going to be doing all these amazing things around the world in the name of Jesus and it's going to be incredible. And, and then life turns out really differently than what you expect sometimes. And it's not that those goals or those dreams or those things aren't great. It's just that the reality of life is it doesn't always turn out the way you write it down on paper. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so um, my wife and I, we dated when I was, uh, in 1992, I was in year 12. Um, who, who was born 
by that stage. Any of you guys were born then? Do you know what 1992 is? Nirvana was big, you heard of them? Um, yeah, right, okay, I'm talking to Tim. All right, so um, anyway, uh, Google them. So I was in year 12 and I met this girl in the playground or I saw her and her eyes captivated me and I went, oh, I need to find out who she is. And I found out who she was because uh, my other friends introduced me. Got to have friends like that. And uh, we started dating. We went out for a year and a half and then I made the worst decision of my life and we broke up. And my parents let me know that that was the worst decision of my life and lots of people did. Um, and I agree. Anyway, a um, whole more than decade passed and we had all kinds of like, you know, crazy lives um, in, in different parts of the world. Not that far away, but, you know, like we had our own separate lives. And then um, I was driving home one night and pulled up at a set of lights and Teresa pulled up at a set of lights too. And we spoke at the lights for like 20 seconds and then I thought about following her home. <laughs> um, it was just a thought. I... I didn't do that um, for the obvious reason. That would be a bit weird. Um, but I rang her brother and said I saw his sister. And, you know, long story short, he contacted her. She contacted me. We went out. Uh, a year and a half later, we got married. Uh, Dr. Barry Chant um, officiated our wedding. Some of you may know him. And uh, this next year, we'll be married 10 years. And it's been awesome. Now, um, I, I say that word, it's been awesome because that's what we always say, right? It's been awesome. The actual reality is, hasn't all been awesome. She is awesome. My wife is awesome. Let's be clear if she hears this podcast or whatever. <laughs> she is awesome. It's just my contribution hasn't always been awesome. Uh, I'm just happy to own that. <laughs> Phew. And, um, but you know what? We start off with dreams and hopes and desires. And life goes a bit like this. This is my wife, uh, Teresa, in the middle there. Um, that's my daughter, Soraya. Now, I've shared over the years here um, part of our journey. So when we got married, we wanted to have um, children, and we worked out pretty soon we couldn't have children. And so we went on a whole path, um, you know, that involved, you know, us praying, um, us begging praying. It's like a different level of praying. Um, searching your heart praying, working out where I went wrong praying, Trying to, trying, to, trying to work out, okay, was there some time where I didn't tithe? Uh, you're holding that against me, God. You know, like, and, and we, when things aren't working out the way we hope, we drift back into a pagan way of thinking like the ancient people did with the gods, where we say, oh, whoops, they're not happy with me. Things aren't happening. The plants aren't growing. The ag our agricultural, you know, fields aren't working out right, so we must do something to appease the gods. And we, we do the same thing with our own God sometimes because we forget about His grace and love and His presence with us and that He's always for us. And we assume that when something isn't happening that I've done something bad and so this is the result. And so can become a very confusing time when you're, you're trying to work out, I don't understand why things aren't working out the way I hoped. And so, um, you know, we, we, we tried everything. And then we ended up going down the path of IVF. And, uh, you know, by God's grace, the first time we tried, we um, fell pregnant and we had this beautiful little girl, uh, Soraya. Her name means Princess of the Lord. Um, Soraya Grace, she's named after my grandmother Grace. And I just think that's a great name, Princess of the Lord and Grace. Like, what a great combo. I think she's going to win the what's your name mean um, <laughs> game always. And, um, but she'll lose for how to write her name because it's the hardest name ever to write because we thought we were being cool, coming up with a fancy way to write her name. And now every day it's like, how do you spell, how do you write that? <laughs> Bit of a fail there. So, um, but here's the reality. When uh, we fell pregnant, it felt like, oh, God's blessing was on our lives again. and It was all good. So then we went, well, while it's going good, and while God's blessings on our life before it kind of goes somewhere else again. You know, we, I'm a pastor. I shouldn't be thinking those thoughts, but sometimes those thoughts go in your head. Let's, let's do this again. Obviously, we have God is with us and this is working out great. So we, we tried again five more times and $30,000 later and we, we couldn't fall pregnant again. And that was over multiple years and a lot of pain, a lot of physical pain, a lot of trial, a lot of questioning, a lot of confusion, a lot of heartache, a lot of, you know, both before we had Soraya and after Soraya, lots of Mother's Days, um, where it's, there's a little ache in my wife's um, heart because all she wanted to be, uh, she felt called to be, was a mum. 
just had that just that maternal drive and desire. And, you know, every time, you know, she's got sisters, you know, oldest one who has five kids, youngest one who has three, and, you know, all my brothers having their kids. And there was, we got a church where, like, there's lots of love, and there's so many babies. And um, um, cause don't think about it too much. Anyway, so um, there, these babies everywhere, and every time someone comes to say, we just had a miracle, we've fallen pregnant. And my wife, would, she was amazing, and she would rejoice to these people. And she would just say, I'm standing with you, and I'm so excited for you. And in her heart, she'd come back to me, and she'd say, this is both before Sarai and after Sarai. I don't understand why it doesn't happen. I don't understand. Um, and isn't life like this? You get a dream, and then there's this waiting, 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 waiting. Waiting. Sometimes waiting is very annoying. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone waiting for something at the moment? Some of you are going, yeah, I'm waiting for you to finish. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And try my best. Trust me. You, you weren't meant to laugh that much then. Um, <laughs> you're waiting for a desire or for a dream or for a goal to be fulfilled. And sometimes the waiting can be so painful. And then the waiting turns into a coming to terms with the fact that that dream is broken and that dream isn't going to happen. I have some dear friends of mine, they've even written a book on it. Um, some of you may have heard of Sheridan and Meryn Voisey, who's a radio personality in Australia and award-winning author. And uh, They write in their book, Resurrection Year, about their journey um, over a decade of having prayed and believed and, and tried IVF and just everything and coming to terms with the fact that they would just not be able to have a child. And it's just so difficult, so painful. And that was even difficult for us because then we had our dream realized when we had our little girl born. And then you feel bad for those who yet haven't had their dream realized. And there's this tension and, and trying to come to terms every day with the fact that one of us is rejoicing while one of us is sad and grieving. That's the world we live in. And then, strangely, sometimes the dream then becomes realized. We thought we couldn't. And then we did. And we have a beautiful little girl and she's wonderful and she's super strong-willed. About a parenting expert tell us, ah, oh, that's really good when they're older. I'm like, okay, waiting, waiting. <laughs> the reality of the dream realized sometimes is that you finally get the dream. And then the dream isn't quite like what you thought the dream would be. The child's a little different to how you dreamed. The marriage is a little different to how you dreamed. You waited and you waited and you waited. That was my first story that I shared here many years ago about how I waited for so many years as a Christian young man for the one. You know that thinking? The one. And the one came and then the one wasn't the one. Or I don't know what happened. Because two years later, that marriage ended as a result of a bunch of traumatic experiences. And that was a time in my life where I just went, man, that wasn't what I dreamed when I was 18. And that wasn't what I was waiting for. And that didn't turn out the way I hoped. But yet God was with me through it all. And then this little boy just recently came into our life. His name's Jacob, which was the name we wanted to call a boy if we had our own boy. We adopted, or we're in the process of adopting this little boy. And so uh, about five years um, ago, we started the conversation about potentially adopting. And then three years ago, we joined an organization um, and went on the process with Bernardo's. Um, and... We, again, were so excited and we got trained and equipped and we're ready to go. And, we're, and you know, we thought any day we're going to get this phone call. They're going to tell us there's a little, um, little baby to come into your family. And we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited and we thought it's not going to happen. And we had all the conversations. Let's pull the pin. That's it. Let's move on with our lives. It's not going to happen. And then a week came about which I will never, ever forget. And in this week, it was a week of dreams realized and broken dreams that all happened in the same week. And here's what happened. 
It was a Tuesday afternoon and I got a phone call from a gentleman who comes to our church. And it was one of those phone calls that I'll never ever forget. And I took the call and I was in my room at the time. I was putting my shoes on. I was sitting on the side of my bed and my wife was sitting on the other side of the bed. And she was sitting there and she realized it was one of the, you know, she, she sort of stopped and she was waiting for what, where's this phone call going? And he rang me to tell me that um, his partner, he'd, he'd been coming along to the church, he's agnostic, he'd been coming along to the church for a little while. Um, his partner, they're not married, um, they, were, they were coming along to the church. He had a Christian background and wanted to come to church. And um, they had a little girl and they were pregnant again and she was due to have the baby that week. And he rang me to say that there'd been a terrible accident and that during the process of her um, heading to in labor, um, that... Um, she had an extremely rare condition that happened, uh, was rushed to the hospital, uh, went into an operation, they lost the baby, she almost lost her life. Um, and thanks to the incredible medical expertise we have in this country, she was, uh, ended up being okay. Um, but this little baby boy passed away. And he rang me to ask, not even knowing the right religious terms to use, would I come down to the hospital and christen or bless this baby boy? And I, st I still remember I started to shake. And I just felt this overwhelming sense of, oh, man. And in 20 years of being a pastor, I had never, ever experienced this or, or participated in something like this. So I got off the, I said, I'll come, I'll come down this afternoon. So I got off the phone and I said to my wife, who's a senior social worker and works in, you know, um, bereavement and, and um, you know, end of life. Uh, work, I said, I, I need you to come with me and, and, and help me with this because I haven't done this before. And she said, okay, I'll come. So we got Soraya looked after and we headed down to the hospital and I went down with this sense of, oh, Lord God, give me the wisdom. Uh, you know, I, was, I, I felt unprepared. I, I didn't know what to expect. And I got to the hospital and we went in, we walked into the room and um, we just, you know, we just cried with this couple. And the, the mother was in the bed and uh, the father was standing there and none of us could talk. We just held hands and we, we cried. And then they said, can we, um, can we bring our, <clears throat> sorry, it's a, still a bit raw for me. Um, but they said, can we bring um, our boy up uh, so you can um, pronounce a blessing over his life. And for me, I went, I'm, we're going to dedicate this little boy to our, to our Savior and King. And so uh, the nursing staff brought him up and brought him into the room and Oh man, that was a, I was like, oh God, get, help me in this moment. This is pretty confronting. And, um, and they said, uh, you know, can you hold our boy and, and pray for him? And I said, absolutely. But in my head and heart, I'm going, I don't want to do this. I don't know if I can do this. And my wife looked at me and she looked at me with those eyes that, you know, a loving wife does and says, it's all right, I'm with you, you can do this. And so I held this little baby and um, I was so shocked as I realized the coldness of this little baby in my hands and yet the preciousness of this moment. The tragedy, the loss, and yet the privilege in that moment to stand with this couple in this you know, most difficult moment of their lives. And I realized there's a holy moment going on here. And I just did one of those sort of prayers in my head where I said, God, please give me the right words to pray here. And I began to pray and I said, there are just no words. There is nothing we can say that can make this right or make this good. And I prayed a prayer of blessing over this little boy and I prayed for these parents and we cried together and we stayed together in the room like that for the next 30, 40 minutes. And then a little while after that, uh, we, we left them and we drove home and we had to tell their friends and family uh, what had happened. And I was so exhausted that night, absolutely emotionally spent. And then I wake up the next day and I head off to work and I go to the office and I get a phone call from my wife and she rings me up and says, are you sitting down? And I'm like, oh man. <laughs> I'm like, I can't deal, this is all in split second in my head, I'm like, I can't deal with this. And she went, I've got good news. And I'm like, oh, phew. And uh, she said, but you're gonna need to be sitting down. And I wasn't sitting down, I was walking around pacing because that's what I do. And uh, I walk downstairs into this factory unit and I'm walking around and she says, guess what, we got the call. And I'm like, whoa. And she said, we have a little boy and he's gonna be coming to our home and his name is Jacob, which is the name we wanted to call our boy if we had a boy. I found a chair 
Because literally, I felt like my knees went. It was a weird experience. I felt like, wow, this is what it feels like when you really, like, you know, go all shaky. And I sat down, and I'm shaking, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. And there was such joy and excitement, and we cried, and we laughed, and we just went, wow, this is amazing, and we're going to see you in the next couple of weeks, and this is going to be amazing. And then I got off the phone call, and I'm realizing, oh, my goodness, in the last, you know, like 24 hours, I've gone from one couple who are trying to come to terms with a broken dream to a dream being realized for us. This is too hard in the same week to get my head around. As a matter of fact, I need to debrief and try to get my head around it. And here's the, here's the thing about that. I then spent the rest of that week meeting with that other couple and having to at some point explain to them our news because they were going to hear and then at the same time wrestle with them and their pain and grief. And here's this guy who's been coming along to our church and he's not the Christian as we would understand and, and he's talking to me about all this stuff and we're sitting in a cafe and he looks at me and he says, I talked to God this morning. And he says, and I said, God, what kind of a blankety blank God lets this happen to a little baby and to us? But if you are real, and if you are a good God, then maybe there's something about this I don't understand. And he says this to me. And I say, that is one of the best prayers I've ever heard. Okay, it reminds me, and I, I, this is literally what I said. I said, it actually reminds me of some of the Psalms and lamentations in the Bible. I said, this confusion and this doubt and this frustration and this anger and this, I don't understand. And, and he's like, really? And we had this amazing conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we continued to meet in, in planning for that uh, funeral, and that funeral is the most difficult thing I've ever done. And, you know, and yet somehow in the confusion and the doubt, God was there, and yet it was hard to get our heads around, and there was no, like, simple answer. There was nothing that I could just say that was going to change it or resolve it. And we had to live in the tension of both rejoicing over something good that was happening that week and being sad and mourning with those who were grieving in that moment. And that context is what I want to talk about for the next few minutes around what it means for us to live out this mission that's so possible for every one of us to live. And this is the mission. The mission is that we are to, as God's people, as followers of Jesus, to announce and to demonstrate the universal reign of God in Christ. That's our mission. To go into the world, wherever we go, whatever day is ahead for you today or tomorrow, and to announce with our words and with our lives and to demonstrate with our lives, this is what God's kingdom of heaven on earth looks like under the leadership and the reign of King Jesus. Amongst the beautiful mess, amongst the pain and amongst the joy, amongst the beauty and the tragedy, this is how we live under Christ our King. And in that, we embrace the beautiful mess because that is the reality that we live in. And so the three thoughts I want to share with you before we wrap up this morning is this. If we're going to engage in the mission of Jesus to announce and to demonstrate with our lives what Christ's kingdom on earth really looks like, then we need to be willing to embrace the beautiful mess around us. And that means rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn crying and grieving and saying, I don't know and I don't understand and I'm not sure how. But I have this hope that somehow God is with us in this moment and that in time we may look back and see God's gracious guiding hand. But for this time, we will stand together and we will pray and we will cry and we will journey together because that's what God's people do. And then when someone else has their dream realized and a miracle happens and they're healed or they have the child they've been waiting for for so long, or they finally find someone that they can spend their life with that they love and they want to commit to. And we can celebrate with them, understanding that when we turn up to that wedding and we celebrate with them, there will be someone standing at that wedding who in their heart of hearts will be saying, God, when? And our role fulfilling the mission of Jesus will be to stand with that person and not give them an answer that makes us feel better. Like, hey, hang in there. It worked out for me. Look at me. I mean, look at I, you know, I'm pretty good for, you know, God can do this for me and then he'll do it for you. 
that doesn't help that person because that person's going, well, 40 other people told me that and it's not working. Sometimes we just have to stand and say, I'm with you. Because that's what God does to us. He doesn't always come with heaps of answers. It's just God's presence, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the kingdom of heaven on earth. And we get to live that out. So that's the first thought. The second thought is, if we're gonna fulfill the mission of Jesus in the world, we need to be authentic. We need to be real. We can't go around telling everyone, here's how awesome it is being a Christian. Being a Christian looks like this. Look at my Instagram feed. Look at my Facebook feed. My life is awesome, and it's all because of Jesus. That's not real. I'll take on anyone who says, my life is unbelievably awesome all the time, and go, let's just have a little chat. Because you forgot to take a couple of photos of a few things. Because the reality is, social media is the highlights reel. It is for me. I don't post up what my Saturday morning was like yesterday. Do you want to know what it was like? So the day before, let me just take you back. I didn't get to tell this in the first service. I was standing out the front and I'm washing the car after coming back from a holiday uh, with our family. And the car's just filthy dirty. I'm washing it. My daughter comes out into our street with all of our neighbors just getting home. She's yelling out, my dad's going to Adelaide to preach because he's the best preacher in the world. And I'm going, who told you that? Oh, did I tell you that? Uh, you know, <laughs> just kidding. Um, and I'm like, no, no, shh, don't, don't say that. That's, it's not very seeker friendly. Like, you know... <laughs> And I go, no, no, we don't talk like that. I go, that, we don't boast. She goes, like, what's boasting? I'm like, we've got to be humble. What's humble? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't even know how to explain it. I'm just like, just don't talk, all right? And um, <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? Like my, it's like awesome passion for Jesus. It's great, but it doesn't always translate into the street. And, um, and then the next morning I get up so Daddy can go off and preach it down in Adelaide. And uh, I'm like, everything's going good the first five seconds and then um, kids wake up it's like a little bit crazy and then my wife drives me to the train station so I can get the train uh, to the airport and to come down here and it's gonna be great and just be praying that God will be with my wife while she looks after the two kids because she's got the really hard job and um, I get a phone call on my way through the first train stop and I'm like who? I don't know who this is so I just I let it go if I don't know who it is I'll, just, eh, I'll leave a message if it's important then I get a text message from this number I don't even recognize it says you have the house keys and I'm like what I'm going oh is it from the people where we stayed at their house during the week so I ring the number and it's my wife and I'm going what's going on she's going I'm at Ken's house next door and you've got the keys and we can't get in and my phone's in the house because I didn't think I needed it and the kids are crying and Sarai needs to get to Little Athletics and can you get off the train? I'm like, I can't get off the train. I'm on the way to the airport. I've got to get this plane. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So I stop at the next stop and I just jump off the train and I go, okay, you're going to have to come pick me up. So she comes, picks me up. Uh, we drive back home. Our little one-year-old boy, um, he starts vomiting in the back from all the curves on the way to our house. I'm like, oh my goodness. We get home and we walk in and Teresa arranges for my father-in-law to drive me to the airport. And she's like, okay, I don't feel stressed anymore. It's going to be all right. And the neighbor's going to take my daughter to Little Athletics. And she goes, I'm just going to make a coffee. And she goes to make a coffee and the coffee machine won't work. She's like, the coffee machine's not working. And she's like, and the dishwasher's not working at the moment. And my daughter's sitting at the bench and she just goes, the whole house is breaking down like this. And I'm sitting in the kitchen going, whoa. What's going on here? And I go, Soraya, the whole house isn't breaking down. It's an exaggeration. Oh, and I'm like, and I'm driving to the airport with my father-in-law. And I'm like, going, oh man. Hey, now that's the reality of my life as a follower of Jesus. <laughs> Not every single day is like that. But then I post a picture and just go, hey, how cool is this? Look at my cute little family. Yay, awesome. <laughs> I just go, oh, look at his life. His life's awesome. There's some things about my life that's awesome, but there's some things in my life that are just pretty ordinary, and there's some things about my life that are terrible, they're really hard work. If we don't engage our life with others around about us, this is how life is, and this is the difference that Christ in my life makes, then we don't do a very good job of announcing and demonstrating the mission of Jesus. Does that make sense? So be authentic, because imagine the alternative. People get fake. They begin following Jesus, and then all of a sudden, they go, well, hang on, it's not working out for me. Things aren't happening. Dreams aren't being fulfilled. And they start thinking, what's wrong with me? 
That's why pastors and leaders and mature Christians and anyone who's been around for some time needs to tell the full story. Because when you tell the full story of this is how it really is and this is the difference that God's grace and hope and mercy and spirit makes in my life. And the final point I want to close with is this. If we're going to announce and demonstrate to the world the reign of Jesus Christ and what that looks like, then we need to journey with people. I say that because my friend that I was just telling you about who lost his little boy, we've been on a journey together. And he comes along and he doesn't know what he thinks about the songs and he always talks to me about the messages and asks me questions. And we have a number of people actually are agnostic and we even have one atheist apparently um, who comes along and I go, that's wonderful. That's what, that's what we're about. Let's go on the journey. And the one thing I've realized is as I'm getting older, I'm less trying to convert everyone as quick as I can. And I'm finding myself going on the journey, the very human journey with God's spirit present with people. And I'm realizing, I think I probably have a, a wider view of God's amazing grace and his, in his sovereign work in people's hearts and lives. But I'm realizing that sometimes I'm trying to convert people so quick that I actually miss out on the very genuine, authentic journey they need to go on of discovering what I've discovered over many, many years. And so my fr- friend says to me, and we're out at lunch just a week ago, and he says, hey, those people were up sharing on the stage at church the other week, and you said if there's anyone you'd like to share your story, come and talk, because we can never get anyone to come up and tell their stories. It's hard work. He said, I'd be happy to share my story. And in my head, I start off, I go, are you even a Christian yet? (laughs) I go, because we only have Christians on the stage, you know. It's all like, like my Bible college brain's like kicking in going, what about this? What about that? What about this person? If you put him up there, this person will say this to you. Did you clarify? Did you talk to him? about All this stuff's going to my head. And I, and I just look back at him. And at the same time, I go, that'd be awesome. Which is what in my heart I really felt. And I said, it would be so good. And I said, what would you want to share? And he said, I'd like to share my journey. Because when I heard that guy on stage talk about his journey, I thought, oh, that's similar to my journey. And how I probably wouldn't go to any other kind of church, but I'd go to a church like this. And uh, how, how I'm discovering faith. And um, he, uh, he says to me, I, I think I could tell about how this church community here has blessed my partner and myself so much and helped us on our journey. I said, that would be incredible. The guy turned up to our church who'd made a total wreck of his life. And he saw the sign at the front doors that said, no perfect people allowed. A, a phrase we ripped off from a book, because we rip off everything. And um, <laughs> he saw the sign and he went, it's my kind of church. He walked in, broken person. And we've been on a journey and he rings me up one day in a terrible situation. And little did I know, that over the next year, I would begin driving him to work on a Tuesday morning. It would take me 50 minutes one way and 50 minutes back to my office because I made a commitment on a heart. I can't do it for everyone, but I can do it for one to help this man put his life back together and discover the grace and the redeeming work of Jesus. And just recently he said, I'm getting ready to share my story to him. But you know what happened at first? When I first, I thought, I'm going to help this guy. It's going to be an awesome story. He's going to put his life together. It got worse. It got worse. It got worse. He said to me so many times, it's all right. You can give up on me. Uh, And I just kept saying, I will never give up on you. But I said, but more important than me, God will never give up on you. He said, thank you for journeying with me. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Makes all the difference in the world. This is our mission. Let me finish with this scripture. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. People are watching how we live our lives. The greatest witness you can have is to navigate the beautiful mess in a way that both represents the authenticity of God's spirit at work in your life, engaging the pain, the suffering, and the struggle of life with the beauty and the joy and the miracle of life all together. Let's pray together.